Hi, welcome to the introduction of cardiovascular physiology. Now to introduce cardiovascular physiology, we're gonna break this lecture up into two parts. In this first part, we're gonna learn about circulatory patterns. We'll look at the heart anatomy as it applies to physiology. And then we're gonna end by looking at the cardiac cycle and a little bit about the coronary circuit. Now the second part of this lecture is gonna focus a little bit more on blood flow. And we're gonna learn some physics properties that apply to flow of fluid through tubes. And why this is applicable is because those same principles are gonna be applied to the flow of blood through blood vessels, which of course are just tubes. So the cardiovascular system is comprised of the heart and all associated blood vessels. Now the purpose of the cardiovascular system is to move blood. Because the purpose of the cardiovascular system is to circulate blood, a lot of times the cardiovascular system is known as the circulatory system. Those terms can be used interchangeably. I tend to use cardiovascular system for no good reason. Um, I just like it better. But if you hear circulatory system, which looks more at the process of circulating blood, or at least takes that lens, then that means the same thing as a cardiovascular system. So if the purpose is to transport blood, well, what's in blood that's so important to transport? Now, most people, if I ask, what is the purpose of transporting blood, would say something like oxygen or CO2 maybe, but a whole lot more is transported in the blood beyond oxygen and CO2, which are very important, but they're not the only things transported in the blood. So let's list some of the other things that might be transported in the blood. Water. So when you drink a glass of water, it goes into your digestive system that gets picked up by your blood and then circulated through your body. Ions, so sodium, chloride, potassium, um, calcium, so those are some of the big ones. And then we also have nutrients like glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, nucleic acids. And then how about the waste products when we break those down? CO2, of course, is one of those waste products. But there's others as well, like urea, uric acid. We're going to learn about those actually farther down the line. And then we also transport things like antibodies and hormones and heat. So those are all things that are transported by blood. And of course, the importance of being able to reliably circulate your blood is, I think, intrinsically understood by just about everybody. Because if you lose your pump, which is the heart, and you do not transport blood anymore around your body, you die pretty quickly. So therefore, we know that being able to circulate blood reliably and consistently is vital to our life. So when we take a look at the blood flow, the blood is gonna go through some chambers of the heart and then goes out into the body, comes back through some chambers of the heart and goes back out into the body. It turns out that there's two major circuits, one of which is called the pulmonary circuit and pulmonary means lungs, and the other of which is called the systemic circuit. Now systemic just kind of means whole body. So it's really everywhere else or almost everywhere else. There's actually a third circuit that's not highlighted here, and that is the coronary circuit. Now coronary means heart. So that's right, the heart has its own circuit, and we're gonna take a brief look at that at the very end. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is draw out this basic um, circulatory pattern. And of course, the heart is the center of the circulatory pattern, so we need to start by drawing out a heart. So go ahead and get a pen or a pencil and follow along in this drawing. You do want something with an eraser because I'm gonna be erasing some of the stuff that I draw. All right, I'm gonna start by drawing the heart. I practiced a lot when I was five and six years old at drawing that heart. Of course, it is not anatomically correct, but it gives us a starting point to go ahead and draw the parts that I want you to know about the heart. So most people know that the heart has four chambers. And so really when we think about these four chambers, there's a left and a right side of the heart, and then there's top and bottom chambers on each side. So what we wanna do is divide the heart up 
into the left and the right sides. Now the left and the right sides are going to be superimposed on you, just like all anatomical features are. So this is my right side of the body, and so my right side of the body, this would be my right side of the heart, and this would be my left side of the heart. So when I draw this, I'm going to put right there and left there, even though from a mirror image it looks backwards. Okay, then we have top and bottom chambers as well. The top and the bottom chambers are separated by a special set of valves, and if you've already had anatomy, you'll know these to be atrioventricular valves. If you have not yet had anatomy and you're like, what was that word again? Don't worry, we're going to write it down a little bit later. But you know there's a set of valves that separate the top and the bottom chambers. Now the top set of chambers are called atria, or atrium for singular. So let's go ahead and draw that. The bottom, that, the bottom chambers are known as ventricles. So what we have is our four chambers. Now I'm going to name them and then I'm just going to put a little check as I name them on the screen. So we're going to start with the right atrium there. Then it goes to the right ventricle. We also have a left atrium and we have a left ventricle as shown there. So those are our four chambers. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to draw the circulatory pattern. So I'm going to start by erasing little bits here and here. And I'll go ahead and erase ventricles and atria. By the way, you might notice that when I draw the heart this way, the ventricles come down to a shape like this. That's a V, so V is for ventricle, and then atria is the other one on top. So if you've never um, learned heart anatomy before, that's kind of a cute way to start getting familiar with it. Okay, so I've gone ahead and erased those sections, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in blood vessels. I'm going to use orange for no good reason here. And we're going to learn what those blood vessels are, again, in just a little bit. So up here, to draw my circuit circulatory patterns, I'm going to start by drawing in a pair of lungs. Like so. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to draw in the rest of the person. Like so. Okay, so I'm going to use um, red and blue to denote oxygenated or poorly oxygenated blood. So we call this O2 rich blood, meaning that it's well oxygenated, where O2 poor blood, or at least poorer blood, um, looks blue through the um, skin, through the veins. But if you would actually extract O2 poor blood, it would be more purplish. But we'll go ahead and use, you know, I'll go ahead and use purple. Like so. Okay, so let's go ahead and follow this pattern. So we're actually going to start with oxygen poor blood. Oxygen poor blood is going to get funneled into the right atrium. And from the right atrium, it's going to go into the right ventricle. So blood moves from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And then blood is going to get pumped out of the right ventricle, and it's going to get funneled into the lungs. Now the purpose of going up to the lungs is to reoxygenate your blood and to get rid of excess CO2. So as it goes by the lungs, that blood is going to turn into oxygen-rich blood, assuming everything is working correctly. And then it's going to come back down into the left atrium, where it will go into the left ventricle, 
And then the left ventricle is the workhorse of the heart. And the left ventricle provides the biggest push or the biggest oomph to get it way out into the body. And then what we're going to do is deliver that oxygen to various cells of the body. And as a consequence, by the time the blood is coming back, it is oxygen poor, like so. So you'll notice that the right side of the heart deals with oxygen poor blood and the left side of the heart deals with oxygen-rich blood. Okay, so let's go ahead and label these. So up here we have our pulmonary circuit. And down here we have our systemic circuit. So you should be able to follow a drop of blood as it goes through the chambers in the circuit. So again, we start from our right atrium going into our right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to push blood out into the pulmonary circuit that goes by the lungs. Then it's going to come back around into the left atrium where the blood will then get moved to the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it's going to go everywhere in the body. Now, this is a pretty simplistic drawing. What I'm gonna do now is show you a little bit more of the truth. In other words, how the circulation pattern actually looks. And if you have already been through anatomy, you've had to learn about a lot of these um, arteries and veins already, so this is not new to you. But again, we can still follow the circulatory pattern. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and follow the circulatory patterns. So we're gonna start with the heart, so there's the heart. We know that the heart has four chambers, and we know that there's a, a right side and a left side. We also know that there's a top and a bottom. So up here is the right atrium, and you can see that word there. And then over here is our left atrium. You can see that word there. This is our right ventricle and our left ventricle. So if we follow this, we know that we start with blood coming in. This is oxygen for blood, as shown in blue is gonna come in to the right atrium, shown here, and you might notice that there's actually two different blood vessels that are kind of converging. If you've been through anatomy, you know these as the vena cavas. We have an inferior and a superior, and that's just because our heart is kind of in the center of our body. It's not at the very top and it's not at the very bottom, so we get blood draining from the top of our body and blood coming up from the bottom of our body. So those are two blood vessels that converge. Then, that blood is going to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it's going to get pumped out into the lungs. So this is the pulmonary circuit, it's very short. And again, if you think anatomically, your heart is here, your lungs are here, that's not a big distance. It's pretty easy to make that trip. So once we get into our lungs, we're gonna pick up oxygen so that we come back into the left atrium, from the left atrium we go to the left ventricle. The left ventricle then ejects blood forcefully out into a blood vessel known as the aorta. And from here, we now notice that we go up and we go down. Okay, so when we go up, we go out to the arms, we go up to the head and the brain. When we go down, if you see this, you can see this is going to be the torso, we have liver, we have digestive system, we have kidneys, and then we have everything, all of our lower limbs. And then all that blood flow is going to come back up like so. So it's pretty much the same thing. I'm just showing you a little bit more detail. Now, now is a good time to introduce some other terminology associated with these um, vessels that you might see. You might see these terms that are noted as arteries, and I'm highlighting one there. We have arteries and we have veins. Now, when students first learn about blood vessels, they are tempted to make this correlation. Arteries carry oxygen-rich blood and veins carry oxygen-poor blood. It turns out that's only true for the systemic and the coronary circuit. The opposite is true for the pulmonary circuit. So that's not a good correlation to make 
Instead, let's actually define what an artery and a vein means. So arteries are the blood vessels that take blood away from the heart. Whereas a vein is going to be bringing blood back to the heart. Let's look at this diagram one more time. We have here an artery. By definition, it is bringing blood out of the heart into the body, so it's leaving the heart. It's leaving the right ventricle. Notice that it is carrying oxygen-poor blood. So there's an example of an artery that's actually carrying oxygen-poor blood. Whereas this is a vein and it is carrying oxygen-rich blood, but it's carrying it back to the heart. So by definition, it is a vein. All right now that we've introduced arteries and veins um, properly, now let's take a look at the heart anatomy. So if you've already had anatomy, this is going to be a light version of it. What we're going to do is learn to identify some major components of the heart and their basic functions. So I'm going to go ahead and write these out. Things that you will need to know. You will need to know the four chambers and be able to identify them. So we already described these as, and I'm going to go ahead and just write the abbreviations. Um, right atrium right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. Okay, we're also going to need to know the valves that are separating some of the parts of the heart or the heart from the blood vessels. And so there are two sets of valves. One set of valves are called the atrioventricular valves. And you'll notice that atrioventricular valves has the term atria and ventricles in them. So guess what these valves separate? The atria from the ventricles. Now atrioventricular valves is a pretty lengthy word to say and write, so we abbreviated AV valves. Now we have a right atrioventricular valve and a left atrioventricular valve. Now the other set of valves that we need to learn about are called the semilunar valves. The word refers to more of their anatomy, and we'll see a picture of them so it will become clear why people think of them like the moon. Okay, in addition, we're going to need to know a couple of the blood vessels, just the major ones associated with the heart. The um, memorization of all the other blood vessels is safe for anatomy, but here I want you to know the following. So you are responsible for knowing the vena cava, the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, which branches out into pulmonary arteries, and the pulmonary vein. Not a huge list. So when we take a look at an opened or a bisected heart, um, if you get the correct angle on bisecting that heart, presumably you can see all of these features. Anybody who's actually tried to do that recognizes how difficult that actually is. But let's go ahead and presume that we could do this, and let's look at some of these features. So let's first orient ourselves by identifying the four chambers of the heart. So again, we have left side over here, highlighting it, and right side over here, highlighting it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make little marks. We have our right atrium. We have our right ventricle, we have our left atrium, and we have our left ventricle. So take a moment and just make sure that you can kind of see where these are. Okay, so you'll notice that we have um, the AV valves, which are going to separate the atria from the ventricles. So the AV valves, or atrioventricular valves, 
um, are kind of messy looking. They're not neat and clean cut like the semi-lunar valves are going to be. The atrioventricular valves to me always look like somebody took parachutes and kind of ripped them. But they do function, mostly, in most people anyway. So the atrioventricular valves you can see are going to be here. And I'm going coloring them in. Again, you can kind of see that ripped parachute where the strings are attached to these anchoring spots in the ventricles. In addition, we have our semilunar valves, which look a little bit cleaner and maybe more like we would expect valves to look. And I'm highlighting one here in purple, and that is going to be one that separates the ventricle from the arteries. So the semilunar valves separate the ventricles from the outgoing arteries. So now let's take a look at the blood vessels. So I mentioned that we were going to have um, our vena cava. I'm going to go ahead and highlight it. We have a superior one and an inferior one. Both of those are going to feed in to the right atrium. So again, blood is going to come up into this right atrium. From the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. In the right ventricle, it's going to go out into the central blood vessel known as the pulmonary trunk. That's an artery. And then the pulmonary trunk is going to bifurcate into um, right and left sides. The right side is going to go to the right lung. The left side is going to go to the left set of lung. The right side goes to the right lung. The left side goes to the left lung. We call those right and left pulmonary arteries, respectively. So you can see from coming back, it kind of goes underneath this bridge here, comes out over here for the right side, here's the left side. Okay, and so now we know that that oxygen poor blood is going to go out into the lungs, pick up oxygen, and now come back to um, the left side of the heart, but it's going to come back through pulmonary veins. So let's take a look at those. The pulmonary veins are going to be here and here. Again, left and right side. You can't see the right side, um, but they're back here coming in. And they're all going to feed into the left atrium. From the left atrium, we're going to go to the left ventricle. From our left ventricle, then we're going to pass another set of semilunar valves that are separating that left ventricle from the aorta. You can't see it. It's hidden in the back. But it's going to go through up through the aorta. And so that's the major artery leaving the left ventricle. So that shows you the... So this diagram shows you all of the parts that you're expected to know for this class. Now something that I want you guys to note, if you haven't already noticed it, is that the wall thickness of the left ventricle is drastically different than the right ventricle. And again, if you've had anatomy already, you know this. But if you haven't, take a look. I'm going to go ahead and highlight in red the right ventricle versus the left ventricle. Now that's all muscle tissue. So that's cardiac muscle tissue. Notice the left ventricle has a whole lot more of it, implying that the left ventricle needs to generate a lot more force than the right ventricle does. And of course this is true, because the right ventricle only needs to generate enough force to circulate blood from the heart to the lungs and back again. That's not a very far trip. Whereas the left ventricle needs to generate enough force to get blood going all the way down to your toes and then back up again against gravity. That's a much more difficult trip that requires a lot more pressure and force. Hence, the left ventricle is going to have a thicker wall of muscle tissue than the right ventricle. Okay, so another picture of these valves, just so that you can see them. This is like somebody taking a heart and kind of cutting it maybe about a third of the way down and then opening it up and looking down at it. So you'll see here the semilunar valves are open in this picture. So there's the semilunar valves, whereas the atrioventricular valves, which I'm highlighting in yellow here, are closed in this one.
And this is another look at that same image, but instead of doing a top-down view, we've bisected it and now we're looking in. What this is showing kind of hints at what we're going to see in what's called the cardiac cycle. And what this is showing is that the atrioventricular valve is shut here and the semilunar valve is open. Now, if this ventricle, which is the left ventricle, generates force and one doorway is closed but another one is open, all the blood is going to go through the open one. So the idea is, is that we want the flow of blood to go one way through the heart. We want it to go from the atrium to the ventricle and then out into an artery. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that we open and close doors at the right time. So the opening and closing of these valves determines where the blood is going to go. So you can envision here that if I had blood, and I'll go ahead and just use some red here. So let's say I've got a bunch of blood in my ventricle. And then I squeeze that ventricle. Well, that's muscle tissue, so that's going to apply force to that blood. That blood is going to want to go up. Well, which way is it going to want to go? Both ways. It's going to want to go back into the atrium, and it's going to want to go out the artery. But what we're going to do is shut the way to the atrium, so you can see the shut valve there, so that blood can't go back into the atrium, but instead will be forced out through the artery. So that ensures a one-way flow of blood where we start from the atrium, we go to the ventricle, and then out into the artery like so. So that's going to lead into something called the cardiac cycle. So let's take a look at the cardiac cycle. I'm going to write some notes down before we get started. The cardiac cycle... corresponds to a heartbeat. So it's the sequence of events that correspond to a single heartbeat. Okay, the cardiac cycle is going to correspond to the sequence of events that equal one heartbeat. Now, with the cardiac cycle, it's actually rather complex. A single heartbeat, there's a lot going on. There's the contraction part of it, so that's going to be the actual muscle tissue that's shortening or relaxing. And then we also have the electrical component. The electrical component is going to be deferred and talked about a little bit later, so we're going to wrap that in in a different lecture. For today, here's what we want to look at. We want to look at which chambers of the heart are contracting, shortening. What is that doing to blood? and how are the valves involved? So before we get into the cardiac cycle proper, I first want to tell you a little bit more about the cardiac myocardium, the muscle tissue. Now within the muscle tissue, almost all of it is contractile. So we call those contractile myocardial cells, cells that are gonna shorten and lengthen. So the vast, vast, vast majority of cells that look like muscle tissue are in fact going to shorten and lengthen. But some of them, about 1%, a little less than 1%, are called autorhythmic cells. And autorhythmic cells do not contract. They don't shorten or lengthen. But they are electrical. And they're going to have special properties that we'll talk about in a different lecture. Their purpose is either to set in motion the sequence of events of the cardiac cycle or somehow propagate the electrical signals that are involved in the cardiac cycle. Because we are deferring our conversation of electricity to a different lecture, we're not going to look at those right now. Instead, we're just going to look at the contractile cells. So let me write that down real quick. And then we'll talk about one more set of terminology before finally looking at the cardiac cycle. Okay. So there's one more set of terminology that we need to cover, and that is called systole and diastole, or systole and diastole, depending on who's saying it. So systole, or systole, refers to the contraction. So this is the shortening, the compression, the contraction of the myocardium. Diastole refers to the relaxation of that particular myocardium. So we have two terms to describe whether or not that part of the 
heart is contracting or relaxing. Now, within your heart, as you're going to see, at any given time, you may have parts of it that are going through systole while other parts are going through diastole. So it's not applied to the entire heart, but rather segments of the heart. So now we are ready to learn about the cardiac cycle. The basics are as follows. The atria, both left and right, contract first. So they're going to go through systole, contract. And what that's going to do is that's going to take blood that is in the atria and push it down into the ventricles. Then the ventricles are going to go through their contraction. Now the atria are done contracting. They start their diastole. Instead, the ventricles are going to contract. And when the ventricles contract, they do so from the bottom up. So think like an old school uh, tube of toothpaste where you take the bottom and you squeeze up like this, and that ejects blood or ejects toothpaste this way. So the ventricles are going to squeeze from the bottom up. Both left and right are going to go together. So atria contract first, push blood down into the ventricle. Ventricle squeeze from the bottom up. That's going to eject blood out into the respective arteries. So that's the basics of the cardiac cycle. Let's take a look at an image. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this, and then I'm going to go ahead and draw this out for you, and not nearly as good of detail as this is. So we're going to go ahead and start with our four chambers. So let's get oriented before we do anything else. So we have, I'm going to use this top image here. So we're looking at our heart, and we're going to have our four chambers. Um, we know that we have a left side of the heart. The left side is going to be over here. The right side is here. We have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Okay, we also have our AV valves and our semilunar valves. So it starts by looking at blood that is actually coming in through the veins. So in this case, we have vena cava starting to fill up into the right atrium, or in this case, we have pulmonary veins bringing that fluid in, building up in the left atrium. So the atria are going to fill up with blood. Now, the default position of the atrioventricular valves is to be open. So the atrioventricular valves kind of just stay open. So that means that as blood fills up in the atria, it kind of just starts trickling down into the ventricle. So it's going to start trickling down as well. So to begin the cardiac cycle, what's going to happen is the atria are going to contract. And what that's going to do is that's going to push some of the blood that remains in the atria down into the ventricle. So the ventricle has a full set of blood to work with during their big contraction. So atrial systole happens first, and you can see that here in image number two. You can see that it's pushing the blood down by contracting. Then there's going to be a little bit of a delay, and the atria are going to relax. So again, atrial diastole. Now the ventricles are going to get ready to go through their systole or their contraction. The very first part of ventricular systole actually is about closing those AV valves. So the AV valves go and shut. When that happens, that will prevent blood from going back up into the atria and causing what is known as regurgitation, which is bad. We don't want that. So by shutting those AV valves, we're now redirecting our blood to go out the arteries. Well, the semilunar valves are also shut right now. But the semilunar valves are anatomically designed differently than the AV valves. The AV valves, like I said, look like parachutes. So when they come up and they shut, they shut like this, and if fluid builds up underneath them, it just kind of pushes on that parachute, which just stays shut. The semilunar valves look like this. So when fluid starts building up and pressure starts building up in the semilunar valve, it pushes the valves open like so. So semilunar valves default position is this. When the pressure builds up, it pushes those valves open. When the pressure decreases, the valves fall back together like so. So you can see in image number three, 
that ventricular systole is starting, and the first thing that's going to happen is the AV valve shut. Now, as pressure builds up from the muscle contracting, the blood pressure is eventually going to force those semilunar valves open, and that's going to cause the ejection of blood into the respective arteries. Then the ventricles relax and the process starts over. So you can see that here. Now notice in this image that we have um, diastole in kind of a peach color shown here, where the systole is shown in a different color. So notice that the atrial systole and ventricular systole do not happen at the same time. They happen at different times. But there is also a period of time where there is no systole. It's just diastole all the way around. So now that we've looked at that, let's go ahead and draw the cardiac cycle. Okay, I'm going to draw the heart as a diamond, and I'm going to separate it out into four chambers with blood vessels coming and going, kind of like what we did a little bit earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a quick diamond, like so. I'm going to erase parts of it to denote where the blood vessels are. And now I'm going to draw my chambers. Okay, I'm going to use a different color for my valves. I'll do blue. I'm drawing my atrioventricular valves there. And then I'm going to draw my sem semilunar valves here. So let's go ahead and again really quickly label everything. Up here I have um, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And those correspond to the respective chambers. My AV valves are right here. And then my semilunar valves are there. So what about my blood vessels? I'm just going to name them rather than drawing them out for you. I'll use a purple X to denote where I'm pointing to when I get there. So up here, this is going to be my um, vena cava leading into my right atrium. Down here, this is going to be my pulmonary trunk. Over here, these are going to be my pulmonary veins. This is going to be my aorta, respectively. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with the cardiac cycle. So at rest, which is what was shown here, we have blood coming in. And some of it's leaking down into the ventricles, like so. Okay, the atria are going to contract first, and that's going to give that blood its last little bit of oomph to get all the way down into the ventricles. So the ventricles have quite a bit of blood volume to work with. Okay, so to draw that the atria have contracted, I just made them a little bit darker. So you can see up there the darker black indicates that they're going through a contraction. Okay, 
Now the atria are going to go back into diastole and the ventricles are going to start their systole. Now remember the first step of ventricular systole is that the AV valves are going to shut. Okay, so that is ventricular systole. Uh, so when the ventricle starts its relaxation period, the semilunar valves shut, the AV valves open up again, and the process repeats. Okay, so that's our cardiac cycle. Now this is a picture that shows, again, that cardiac cycle looking mostly at the ventricle and specifically at the volume of blood in the ventricle during the systole phase. So what we have on the bottom here is basically this idea that the ventricle is relaxed over here. Then we start our systole. We start by closing our AV valves. Then we're going to get enough force in our ventricle to actually push blood out, and then we relax again. Now what this is showing is the amount of blood that was in the left ventricle before ejection and after ejection. And you might notice, again, this is in mills, it's not all of it. In fact, each ventricular ejection tends to eject about half of the existing blood that's in there, not all of it. So that's kind of an interesting thing that we're going to come back to because there's a name for how much blood the left ventricle ejects for every beat. It is called stroke volume. And it's going to be something that we'll look at a little bit later. The very last thing that I want to end with in this lecture is taking a look at something called the coronary circuit. So when we went back to our circuits, we saw that we had a pulmonary circuit and we had a systemic circuit. But there is a third circuit, and that third circuit is called the coronary circuit. The coronary circuit is the series of arteries and veins that bring oxygen-rich blood to the myocardium and take oxygen-poor blood away. Now, this might seem a little weird, because after all, blood is constantly going through the heart. Why does the heart need its own set of blood vessels? The answer is pretty simple. The heart myocardium is too thick to rely on diffusion of oxygen and CO2 from the blood into the surrounding tissues. You might get the surface layer, but that's it. To ensure that all myocardium cells get access to good oxygen, you need your own circuit. And so this is the coronary circuit.
Now if a clot develops in the coronary circuit, that is what is known as a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, but that's going to be saved for another lecture. So that concludes this lecture. I'll see you for the next part, which is going to look at blood flow.